professional theater journalist since about 1999 and uh, worked about eight years full time as the managing editor of theatermania.com. And right now I am, uh, you know, I, I freelance and I write a blog on Asian American performance. So that's me. Hi, my name's Jeremy Tiang. Um, I'm a writer and translator originally from Singapore, lived in the UK for about 10 years, moved to the States about a year ago, and got my green card about a month ago. So I'm kind of <laughs> uniquely unqualified to talk about the state of Asian American <laughs> theatre. Um, and a lot of this will be about me figuring out um, what, what that even means. Um, because, well, we'll come to that, but... Um, Briefly, I'm not sure that I am American yet, and therefore not that I'm not Asian American, so where does that leave me? And yet here I am. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeannie Sakata, and I started out as an actor in early 1980s with East West Players. Um, did a number of shows there, and then branched out to doing regional theater. Um, a lot of the Lort theaters up the coast, Berkeley Rep and ACT, um, some on the East Coast, uh, Public and uh, Lincoln Center Theater, and some others in the Midwest, Chicago, the North Light Theater. And in 2007, I was really honored to make my debut uh, as a playwright at East West Players again. Thank you, East West Players. <laughs> and uh, I wrote a show about Gordon Hirabayashi, um, which Makoto Hirano performed an excerpt of. And uh, it was about a young man, um, college student at the University of Washington in Seattle during World War II, who decided to openly defy and legally challenge the government orders for forced removal of all people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast. So it debuted at East West Players in 2007. Uh, we did couple of high school tours with the special Theater for Youth version. And then we had a separate um, New York production in 2012. And the actor there, Joel De La Fuente, got a, a Drama Desk nomination for Outstanding Solo Performance. Um, since then, it's gone to uh, Playmakers Rep in North Carolina and Honolulu. And we did four performances in Seattle earlier this year. And we're invited back for the main stage season for uh, next year. So. Okay, so um, can I actually ask Jeannie to start us off? Maybe kind of come from that end, and then I'll speak last. About take about five minutes to talk about what you think is the state of Asian American theater right now. You can hear me. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yeah. Oh. You know, this conference has been such an eye-opener for me. And when I ask myself that question, what is the state of Asian American theater, it raises maybe a dozen more questions. Um, I think my answer to that would depend on, it's a many-faceted question. So, for example, um, when I ask myself, what is the state of Asian American theater in terms of the voices and the people writing and the energy and passion of the people writing? Wow. Um, I just had a conversation with someone about uh, how I'm so thrilled at the number of young Asian American female writers there are right now writing for the theater and the diverse voices they have and the amazing diversity of stories that they're tackling. Um, so if you ask me about the quality of the writing and the excitement I feel about that, it's just, you know, fantastic. Um, if you say, you know, I was having a conversation uh, with Tim Dang about m all my New York musical theater friends, whenever they post on Facebook, hey, I've been cast in a show. It's one of three shows. It's Miss Saigon, <laughs> The King and I, or uh, maybe Pacific Overtures. And... And so, you know, if you ask me that question, what is the state of Asian American musical theater in terms of what is being produced, what is providing the jobs for my friends in New York, I would say, wow, we need a lot of, a lot of work done there. Mm -hmm. So um, it, the one thing that I feel very encouraged by here in this conference is the number of conversations 
that I think are being initiated in our community. You know, Tim was talking about um, his initiative to go around to different theaters and talk to them about employing women and people of color and, you know, 2042 and, you know, as at a target date. And I think it's just great that conversations like these are being initiated. Um, sort of a schizophrenia, I think, that we experience as Asian American artists. There's something that happens and you go, wow, that's fantastic. And then something else that happens, you go, oh, we gotta fight this battle all over again. And, but what, I'm, what I think is that, you know, as discouraging as that La, La Jolla thing was, you know, with the casting of, you know, the white actors and, you know, I, I couldn't help but think, talking to Cindy Chung, who was one of the people that, you know, was so forceful in representing our community at the conversations about that, that uh, maybe one thing that came out of that was that Manu Narayan, who's a wonderful South Asian actor, had a key role in the David Mamet play that followed shortly after and got rave reviews and got some sort of award nomination in San Diego. And I thought, I have never heard of a South Asian actor being cast in a David Mamet play at a regional theater. So I, I don't know if that would have happened without that conversation that, you know. Um, so that's my feeling. It's like, you know, you take two steps forward, one step back, or two steps back, two steps forward. It, it's, it used to be that, we, you know, when I was a young actor and we protested Miss Saigon and um, all these other incidents that would come up, and I used to think that once people were educated about these things, you wouldn't have to deal with them anymore, naively. And I didn't realize that, you know, as each generation comes of age, there are all these stereotypical portrayals of Asians and Asian Americans that are embedded in the media. And the next generation comes up and encounters those and we have to educate all over again. So I've kind of accepted the fact that, you know, that education has to constantly take place. So, um, yeah. Um, I'd like to start with the subtitle, which um, here, there, where, and I'd like to think that within those ellipses and within that where is the acknowledgement that our options might not be limited to here and there. Because it, it's not really about um, the immigrant narrative, which is what I read into that. And I think in answer to the question, what is the state of Asian American theater, I would say, as far as I can tell, is that we're moving away from the singular narrative and acknowledging that there are multiple Asian American experiences and that even the term Asian American doesn't capture the entirety of all the voices that are to be heard. Um, and, and a lot of this comes out of my own questioning of, of my role and my presence here. I'm Asian, I'm a playwright, and I live in America. Does that make me an Asian American playwright? Or can I exist outside of that label? What, what does it mean to be Asian, but not necessarily Asian American? Why is that even that term, which, you know, being fairly new to the country, I'm still struggling with. No one ever says white American. Are we insisting on nationality as, as a non-negotiable marker of belonging? And will there come a day when this becomes CARTA, the Conference of Asian and Asian American Theatre Artists? A lot of um, what I've observed of Asian American theatre has been defined by not belonging being between East or West, being between two states. Or to quote um, Boothie in Michael Galamko's play, Extraordinary Chambers, I'm too Cambodian for the black and Latin kids and not Cambodian enough for the Cambodian kids. And is that where a lot of the tension comes from, this lack of belonging? Are we always in between? There is... Um, a, a playwright I, I've met in New York um, called Kyung Park, who is um, of Korean descent, but from Chile. And I always enjoy going to see one of Kyung's performances because his bio says, Kyung is the first 
Korean playwright from Latin America to be produced in the United States? And I always say, yes, yes, he is. That's nice. <laughs> and then I think about wh wh why is that, um, why does that strike the ear as being so odd? And I'm sure Kyung is in part um, including that in his biography as a kind of joke of the ever smaller spaces of contested identity. You know, the, the heiress we lay claim to Within Asian Americanness, we're starting to see Korean American, J Japanese American, and so on, and the, and the further debate of is it okay to cast a Korean American in a Hmong American part? And I don't actually hear Hmong American that often. It, it's, it seems to be within that identity a contested label too. Um, and there's very small demarcations of belonging that I find hard to negotiate as an outsider. Um, and it, it, it feels very fractured and perhaps that's a necessary stage of, of further exploration, further fragmentation. Um, speaking for myself, whenever people ask, you know, where where'd you come from and for things like the census or, or whatever I have to say, well I'm I'm from Singapore of Chinese Malaysian and Sri Lankan Tamil descent and I studied in the UK and now I live in Brooklyn and, and people are like, that doesn't fit in our box. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry I don't fit into your box, but that is the, 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 my identity um, and it doesn't fit into the neat label of Asian American. And I, th I think Asian American theatre will, will have to grow out of the idea that, that it has to be entirely representational and perhaps define itself less as an opposition and um, more, more as just a, a loose collection of voices. What I mean about um, the theater being, defining itself as, as not, um, I think is crystallized by something Jihei Park writes in her play, Hannah and the Dread Gazebo. Um, in which a family crisis pulls Hannah's family back to Korea from America. Um, and her brother, Dang, who complains that Seoul is so full of, like, Asian people, um, complains that he feels less special in Asia rather than America. He says, I walk down the street back home and I see white people black people, fat people. And I know I'm me because I'm not them. Here, any one of these people could be me, some bizarro version of me. And I, I think that sums up how I feel about the idea of definition by opposition. Um, and indeed, the very term non-white makes me uncomfortable. So what I hope is to find a way to define Asianness and Asian Americanness in terms of being rather than not being. I have been uh, teaching a course in Asian American theater since 1999. And when I started that, I've taught about 12 times since then. And I've been thinking about the way that that course has evolved over the years, or over, um, over a decade, I guess, now. And part of that, I think, goes to, one, um, the availability of scripts, as far as, like, um, when, I, when I first started teaching the class, there were, like, four anthologies um, available and a very few um, print editions. And now there's a lot more stuff available for us to look at. And so, um, the, the kind of stuff that was available to me at when I first started teaching the course were a lot of times there were, you know, the, the, the stuff that would try to place um, Asian Americans in the context of America. And I, my, what I mean by that is immigration narratives, um, the internment camp dramas at the <laughs> that we were uh, talking about earlier, um, and a, a number of the things that are the history plays, basically, as far as like the, the way that uh, Asian Americans have, were trying to fit themselves within to narratives of history, uh, and for very specific reasons. So, looking at like 
Jenny Lim's Paper Angels or um, David Henry Wong's Dance of the Railroad or um, you, you, uh, uh, Wakaku Yamauchi's 12-1A. And so, so things like that that were looking at documenting specific moments in history as a way of showing that uh, Asian Americans fit into American history somehow. And it also came out of a very specific kind of construction of Asian America that had to do with the way Asian Americans um, came into a political identity in the late 1960s and early 1970s, which was uh, through this kind of activist movement, oftentimes student-led, that um, consolidated a, a, an American identity, an Asian American identity from people who were identifying as Chinese American or Japanese American um, or, or Filipino American, but who were coming together for the first time and trying to keep, see, see the continuities between the way they experienced <coughs> issues of race within America, um, you know, and also connected to a very political identity influenced by the civil rights movement and the black power movement specifically, and how that particular American identity, th that Asian American identity in the late 60s and 70s was all about um, showing how that experience was grounded in a history of being in America. And then now, uh, right at the, at the time that they were consolidating an American identity, the immigration law changed in 1965. And that had an extreme um, significance to the way Asian American identity then formed for the next decade or so afterwards. But a lot of like the early Asian American work um, that was being done in both liter in, in you know in novels in, lit in literature in uh, plays was all with this perspective of how are we relating to our history in America, and I think now because so much of the Asian American population in the United States is actually either foreign born um, and coming over or newly second generation, right? As far as like my parents immigrated in 1966, so I'm. Uh, second generation Philippine, uh, or, or uh, I guess, I, however you want to define that as far as like it's always that, that, that quick question as far as is first generation who comes over or, <laughs> but you, you, know, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> um, so, 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 there's the, uh, so there's that idea that um, Asian American, we wanted to prove a longevity in the United States. And that was, uh, and, and so that's why there was so much about um, immigration narratives and, and putting ourselves within uh, the American context, but now because there is um, a lot more diverse experience and a, a lot of different ways that people come to America, as uh, Jeremy ind indicates, that we're looking at a much more uh, transnational situation, that um, the, the voices are writing not just about how you locate yourself within America, but how do you locate yourself in relation to Asia, how, how, do you, how do you locate yourself um, in terms of, it was something that came up in the last home session, uh, is the idea of global identity and global citizenship, if you want to call it that. Um, and so how do you locate um, that kind of an identity? And, and I think there's a number of playwrights who are starting to write towards uh, an identity that's not just based in America anymore, or, or like, um, or, or, or trying to incorporate a more complex position in relation to how they are um, treating that. I'm, I'm thinking of, say, um, Jessica Hagedorn's Dog Eaters, which is uh, you know, based upon her novel that she adapted for the stage, but which is um, set in the Philippines and looks at a particular moment in Filipino history through a somewhat fictional lens, um, but also has the character uh, of, of Rio, who is uh, Balak Bayan, returning to uh, the Philippines uh, and kind of like looking like, like she, she, uh, she was, she started there as far as like she, she grew up there and then moved to America um, at a young age and coming back and seeing, uh, you know, political corruption, right? As far as like, like how her father um, has taken care of her customs so that she didn't actually have to go through customs like, like, like how is that even possible, right? As far as like, sh shouldn't I be like everyone else and go through all these things? And so, so looking at a, a changing political situation in the Philippines because of that, or I'm looking at things like um, Ki Win's um, uh, The I Inexplicable Redemption of Agent G, right? So, which is about um, Vietnam and uh, this uh, person uh, returning to Vietnam after having uh, 
it, as, you know, as escaped as a, uh, as, as a young boy and um, his own subject position as a playwright uh, also layered into that as he is performed by an African-American actor because he does it, because that's the way he sees himself as opposed to someone of Vietnamese descent. And so, and how, and how the, his version of Vietnam is all about pop culture, right? It's, uh, like, like influenced by uh, movies and films and, and like, uh, like creating a very different kind of way that um, you experience uh, ish, uh, ideas of Asia in an, area, in an age of globalization. So um, those are the kind of the, the, the things that I think Asian America and maybe the state of Asian American theater is moving towards uh, and perhaps again, not just in opposition to, but trying to figure out where people fit within a global identity that's not really all that defined in a certain sense. Um, if you look at the very first anthology of Asian American drama, Between Worlds, edited by Misha, Ber um, Misha Burson, right? Um, and you read the introduction that each playwright wrote, they all define themselves as cosmopolitan citizens. <laughs> These are Ping Chong, Jessica Hagedorn, David Henry Wong. All of them define themselves as not particularly as Asian American, but they, they don't belong anywhere and they belong everywhere. <laughs> so that this idea has existed for a long time. Um, but at the same time, I think there are dictates of how American theater is structured I'm talking about funding structure uh, of season selections and things like that. That actually dictate how the labels are used. So, for example, Signature Theater in New York City um, did a whole season of David Huang Wong's plays, and um, and he was selected as a the first Asian American playwright, and he's as you know the only Asian American playwright to have even produced on Broadway. So, and he's cel celebrated as you know, representing the entire community of Asian American theater. Um, so that, but that's the only way I think mainstream American theater can understand the significance of what Dave is doing and what everybody else is doing. So th 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 I think the tension has always existed. Um, and uh, Kyung Park's play, uh, one, of, one of his plays is in my anthology and I title my anthology uh, as Korean diaspora plays. So I deliberately did not use Korean American plays. But again, um, that could signal many different things. So I'm, I'm, I'm questioning, you know, because that was included in Duke University Press's Asian collection catalog. <laughs> You know, so, a, and I, I wonder, you know, there's these structures in our society and how do you fit Asian, what's Asian American or whatever is trying to challenge that get label gets then categorized. I think that that goes on. Um, I want to talk specifically about the academia because uh, that's the world I've been in for many, many years. Um, and I have some good news because um, <laughs> 1999, 2000, when Dan and I were graduate students. Now, there are only four of us teaching Asian American theater, and all four of us are here, actually. <laughs> Julie. <laughs> That's Julie, Karen Shimakami, and Dan. 2000, 1999, 2000, that we were the only four people in the entire world teaching Asian American theater <laughs> in higher education. Um, and, and I made a, lo a list of universities that now teach Asian American theater and it's now over 13 campuses teaching Asian American drama and a number of our colleagues, friends now have tenure jobs, tenure track jobs. Um, and if you just calculate, say 15 students per cla class uh, taught once a year for 13 faculty members, that's a lot of people who know about Asian American theater. <laughs> and that's your potential audience members and your performers and artists and your directors. So it's hopeful, I think. And, and that our books are being published. Um, so this, this kind of sense that, oh, you know, we fought Miss, Miss Saigon, so now, <coughs> now we shouldn't have yellow face. And, you know, that if you, that's a sense I had when I wrote my book, A History of Asian American Theater. If everybody read my book, you know, the world would be a better <laughs> place for it. <laughs> 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 we won't have to repeat this, this, you know, tired discussions about, you know, you know race, racism in American theater. Um, but you know, I think like only 50 people read it, so I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but I, another interesting kind of turn of events is that I was recently contacted by um, a director of entertainment at a luxury cruise line, and <laughs> <laughs> it's the most random thing. I, I thought it was a joke by a friend, but you know, he wanted to invite me on one of the cruises 
because uh, cause the, my book was selected as a recommended reading of, <laughs> of this cruise that seemed to be catering to really like rich white people. So I thought this was the most random thing. What is going on? And then things made sense slowly when he gave me more the details that we're going to be talking about flower drum song and we're going to be talking about the, uh, the golden in the time of, of Hollywood when they had Asian theme films and so he wanted to me to do a lecture on flower drum song and have one of the performers who was in David Henry Wong's revival to be there to teach them how to do fan fan you know that, that dance with these <laughs> people on the cruise so I am just like my jaws are dropping and then but but then it's free I should go right so <laughs> Right, so no, exactly. So I thought, okay, if they're gonna read my book, they may completely misunderstand what they're reading, um, but it is time for me to go and, and I said, you know, can I put a historical context to do Flower Drum Song? You know, and he's like, oh, that sounds great. So I will try to ed educate these uh, <laughs> people on my cruise. I'll tell you what happens this next May. We're going to <laughs> um, but, but small steps, it may be misunderstood. It may not be completely digested and, and uh, but we I think we are making changes slowly, whether it's in classrooms or in kind of, you know, the rest of the world out there. Um, so let's, c then can we spend about, about seven minutes to talk amongst ourselves and then we'll open up to the floor. Does that sound good? So do we have any questions for um, each other? Well, I just had a response to, you know, what you said about um, the term Asian American being in opposition um, but I do remember when I went to college, um, and you know, in, I, I, this was in the 1970s, and UCLA had the Asian American Studies Center. That was, you know, I'm so encouraged to hear what you said because back then, Asian American Studies was a very new kind of concept. You know, um, Gordon Hirabayashi's brother, James Hirabayashi, was one of the first dean of ethnic studies at San Francisco, just fighting. For Asian American studies programs, and and I always took the term Asian American to be actually inclusive, in the sense that we, you know, as an ethnic group, we're not accepted as Americans, especially well, my background being Japanese American, I was very aware that, you know, during World War II, we were not accepted as Americans, uh, even though the Nisei were born here and they believed in promises of the Constitution, they were shocked when the government sent them away to the camps as well as their you know, Japanese-born parents. So I remember then that Asian American was a sense, uh, the term was a sense of pride and inclusion that we are part of this country too and that our history is, is part of this country. Um, it could be that you know, times have evolved to the point where you know, it might be worth a, a look to see how that term is used. It could be that it is maybe oppositional in the times we are in now. But um, I just wanted to say about the, the origins of the term, you know, we're, we're very positive as, as I remember myself as a student, you know, back then. I'm dating myself. <laughs> um, but um, I'm very encouraged too because I feel like, you know, all these um, progressive moves are interrelated, whether it's academic and theater and film, the progress we make. I mean, back then I thought it was going into library and information science and I was, I had a job as a part-time job in a children's, progressive children's library at UCLA. And there was talk about stereotypes in Asian American children's literature, you know. And, um, and I, I, it just strikes me how, you know, whether it's the political realm, the theatrical, in film, academics, you know, the, it's, it's all the same challenges we're facing. So um, anyway, I just wanted to make comment. I've got a question for the academics. Um, and and <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is something I've been wondering for a while. Um, the term Asian American theatre is something that's bandied about a lot, but not often defined in, in a kind of, we'll know what it is when we see it. Um, but in the academic world, is there a more formal definition of the term? What are, what are the parameters? I don't think there's a formal parameters other than the, the fact, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because what I teach in my Asian American theater class is whatever I feel 
counts as Asian American theater. So some of it is the thing that everyone would, would recognize as far as like, you know, Frank Chin's Chicken Coop Chinaman is Asian American theater. But then I also teach um, Diana Sun Stop Kiss, which doesn't necessarily have an identifiable, identifiable Asian American character in it, even though Sandra Oh was in the original production. But in the following year, when it was being done all across the country, um, most casts were either all white or did not have any Asian Americans in it, even though Diana Sun s says very specifically in her introduction to the play that she wants it to, to, to reflect the diversity of New York City, right? So, s but, but script-wise, there's no clues within the context of the play to say this is an Asian character, and so people can cast it however they want to. Um, and then, th then other things are, are you know, things that are not written by Asian Americans, but I al also teach, you know, so I teach, um, uh, oh, what, what, what is the one about the, 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 the robot, the female robot? Jenny Chow, yes, <laughs> as far as like the intelligent design of Jenny Chow, uh, which is written by as a self-proclaimed white dude from California, right? Uh, but it involves, uh, you know, transnational ado adoption um, issues. And so that's something that I also teach uh, there. But in, in, and even going back further from the 1960s kind of moment uh, where Asian American identity came into being, then I also want to talk about the chop suey circuit, right? And so in the 1940s and 1950s, and looking at that moment where a bunch of um, actors of Asian descent, before there was such a thing as Asian American identity, were performing in all Chinese reviews, right? As far as like, but they were Filipino, they were Japanese, they were, uh, you know, multiracial uh, uh, kind of configurations um, and again, these are people who are doing this before there was such a thing as Asian American identity. So, uh, so I, I, I tell my students up front that um, we're studying whatever I want to study <laughs> with you, and that's what Asian American theater is. Right. I think it, it, I think it's an evolving term in the, in the academia too. I know that say um, UC Berkeley program changed their um, Asian American studies program to Asian diaspora studies, right? I, and I think the other programs are following that trend. Um, and in, in a, the way I use it in my research is um, how artists have used it. If they identify themselves Asian American, um, then that's, that's what I'm going to use. Um, if you look at um, East West players or, or Pan Asian rep, they didn't initially start with Asian American theme I when they began, um, but it, it became so. So that kind of that phenomenon, that, that kind of history is really what interests me. But that that term still is is, is useful in many ways. And it, uh, but like you said, it's evolving and it's changing. It needs to be changed. Yeah. One other thing, I, I didn't mean to be flippant on that last thing. But what I really meant was um, what I also ask my students to do is to question exactly how we're actually defining it. So the the play the the, the course is designed to say these are the texts that we're going to look at. But as we look at them, we're also going to question how does this how is this genre constructed. Um, how do we, do we perceive Stop Kiss as an Asian American play? Do we perceive Jenny Chow as an Asian American play? So, so interrogating the way that we look at something in addition to actually looking at the work. Okay, I think uh, this is a good time to open up to the floor and Joe is going to f I'm pass the mic around. Right, I'm this um, is being live streamed, so my daughters might be watching me. Yeah, oh and, yeah. no, so um, and you look great. So I, I just wanted to, <laughs> before I share the mic, I'm going to take the floor for just a minute and respond to Esther's cruise ship story. <laughs> that um, some years ago, when I was still um, pretty new in my career and pretty optimistic about um, going to audiences, I was asked by the Minnesota Opera to talk about Madame Butterfly, which, as many of you know, along with the Mikado, uh, one of the evil triumvirate. Um, <laughs> But I, I think, uh, you know, and, and this was before I started doing work on the Mikado, which I eventually wrote into a, a, pro a scholarly project. But I went and um, along with some other scholars um, who were talking about women, uh, female characters in 19th century opera anyway. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, um, Madame Butterfly. And I came with a PowerPoint and I had all this stuff that was about stereotypes and the origins of the story and how Puccini, David Belasco actually changed the ending so that you have the tragic suicide and that's, you know, and then the conflation of sort of the suicide with beautiful music and what that does to your mind. And it was delivered to one of the most hostile audiences I've ever encountered. I mean, I had opera fans and they were aghast. I mean, they were, they were really 
upset by what I said about this novel that they treasure. It was a really, uh, as one of my colleagues put it, a, a really tough house. And so I sort of, <laughs> you know, I, I was, uh, and, and so, but one of the things that did happen at the close of that evening, which for me was a really long evening, um, <laughs> is a young woman, the only probably Asian uh, American person, uh, Asian person in the audience, a young woman, maybe I, I think I would think a late teens or early twenties, came up with her mother and um, and she uh, said to me, um, "Thank you for your talk." And then, you know, on the way out, her mother also thanked me. And her mother was, and she said, that, "You know, this is my mother." Her mother was white. I mean, it's clearly um, someone who was adopted. Uh, I would guess, right? Because we have a lot of transnational adoption in Minnesota. Um, and that, for me, made the whole evening worthwhile. Right? So, so I think in some ways, a lot of the talk has been reaching audiences in the kind of majority and getting everyone. But I think even if you only have one, I, I think one of the things, living in Minnesota, which is primarily uh, a very white, although demographically changing place, you know, when I um, started writing about Asian American theater, I thought really hard about Du Bois, right, the African American theater model from the Harlem Renaissance, by us, for us, near us, about us, right? And, and could we ever make that model work where I lived? Um, and I think to some extent, you have to kind of stretch what us means in all kinds of ways, right? And even if us is a one-on-one -on -one connection, even if there were only four of us, way back when, and even if there are only 13 of us now, there's <laughs> gotta be more. Um, I, I think that's really, really, you know, it, it, it is the important us. So I just wanted to say that before I pass the mic around. Hi, uh, my name's Gina Fisasal, and I'm a resident dramaturg at Alert Theater in the Philly area. And, um, we're um, in season selection, and it's interesting that you brought that up. And I'm curious about how the canon can serve the present global cosmopolitan conversation. Um, because um, going uh, studying Asian American theater history, I feel like I have a grasp of and also co many copies of those plays that I can throw at what we call the artistic cabinet, who's in charge of season selection. But I have to be really strategic about it because we only get however many token slots um, to represent minorities. But also, there's such a huge demand for an all Asian cast in within the canon of Asian American theater. But I also want to help people like Jeremy in conversations when they meet you on the street. And I want to help people that are here making art that are challenging the idea of Asian American. So for me, I'm ha having a really hard time finding, um, like, to uh, of honoring the canon uh, and educating people about it, but also addressing the kind of global cosmopolitan nature of Asian American work now. So I'm just curious to hear from the panel about that relationship, that tension, about what you think serves or disserves the contemporary work that's happening now, and what's useful about me throwing canonical work at a season selection committee. Um, one thing we have to think about in terms of, well, it, it, it is weird to talk about an Asian American theater canon as if there is such a thing, um, but there are certain works that, you know, are taught over and over again. And I think the really important thing to remember is if you think that the uh, Asian American theater canon has been only about Asian American identity, that the most widely taught Asian American play is a play that takes place in China and France and has no Asian American characters in it and that's M. Butterfly, M. M. Butterfly, right? So even just starting with that, you're, you're throwing out or you're, you're not, you're, you're complicating what exactly is Asian American, right? Because everyone recognizes M. Butterfly as an Asian American play. It's the one that got David Henry Wong as the spokesperson for Asian American drama in so, in so many ways, won, uh, won the Tony. Um, and so, there, so there's a, a critical discourse around that particular play but again, it has no Asian Americans in it, right? So, so it, it once you break that part open, then you really have a very wide parameter of what you can introduce as Asian American drama. Hi. Gina, can you be a little more specific for me in terms of 
Um, your, your, your challenge is... <laughs> Sorry. Um, I but think, but yeah. how does Asian American theater, how can it be introduced to um, someone who it wants to see how it fits in a global context, is that? Yeah, I mean, so much of, uh, I think, our struggles, and they, like, you know, you have that, the joke of the where are you from thing. <laughs> so the fight against foreignness, I feel like, is a big struggle that was kind of covered by, I mean, what Esther calls, like, first and maybe second wave kind of generation playwrights to claim our Americanness. And I feel like that's a big part of the canon to say there's, like, uh, to address that, that question of foreignness, that we are just as American as, you know, an O'Neill, <laughs> like characters yeah. in an O'Neill play or something like that. So now with this global, more cosmopolitan kind of movement that challenges this idea of only being American, I'm just curious if those plays that are claiming that American identity as part of do you know what I mean? The central narrative or like the overreaching kind of theme that like of those plays that are within the canon, if they're useful or, you know, or yeah. I understand that they're useful from historical perspective, but, and I, and they're glorious, beautiful plays and stories, but just in terms of, you know, helping with the, that's what, like about Jeremy's conversation about the, where are you from question, <laughs> you know, so there's these plays that say, no, we're not foreign. But then they're saying like, no, 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 it's, it's great to be foreign. And, but so it's, for me, I, I'm one, I feel like there's a chasm between those two I kind of identity claims. So that's why I'm just wondering if it's a, like a helpful, hurtful, like what the, you know what I mean, kind of constructive conversation is between those two. You know, two things pop into mind for me. I think I could think of more if I had more time to think about it. But Years ago, we did uh, Valina Hasu Houston's play T at Syracuse Stage, and we were in, you know, um, it, it, it was a really interesting experience because it's not like there's a lot of Asians, <laughs> you know, the population around that community. Uh, what there was a lot of was a lot of Russian um, immigrants who, uh, uh, who had relatives who came to see the play, who, and it was so interesting because people, they were responding to it so deeply. And I think the plays that we have in the canon um, that speak of the immigrant experience, you know, can potentially speak really deeply to a global audience because they were saying, these are my ancestors, these are my grandparents, these are, you know, they, they didn't, the specifics of those particular women related to the specifics of their community in a kind of great magical way. And it's not something that maybe could have been predicted, but I, I think that's really true. You know, any sort of immigrant experience where you're trying to adapt to a new land um, is universal. And also, I had a very interesting experience with Hold These Trues, where um, a man who uh, was a freedom fighter for uh, against apartheid in South Africa, um, he came up to me after a performance and he was very curious you know, about the play and about the reactions I'd had to it here. And he said, because there are so many parallels for things that we went through in South Africa in terms of you know, that one person that took a stand. And um, I, I just felt that you know, it was something I couldn't have foreseen. Um, and this was a man who had lost an arm to a terrorist bombing because people, you know, pro-apartheid people were after him. And uh, he, I, I was so touched that he related to the play and felt that it was, you know, a play that could speak to a lot of people abroad. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting because it's not something I consciously thought <laughs> of, you know, when I wrote the play, but I, I think there's really great potential for Asian American themed plays to have global appeal. I think maybe we just have to do a little more thinking and art articulation about how that can be so, and you know, certain and, and the populations of pe you know people have said certain plays you should take this to Edinburgh. <laughs> you know, there would be a lot of connection to um, immigrant experiences or people that you know that we don't even foresee. I don't know, maybe Jeremy can talk about this, 
but I, I've just heard conversations like this, and I haven't done, as I said, a lot of articulation about about it. But I think there's great potential there from, you know, from things that I've heard. There are moments when I think of getting a T-shirt made that says David Henry Huang does not represent my experience, <laughs> and that's you know nothing on David. David writes to his experience, I write to mine, and I, I think there's room for us all to have our identities. Um, there's nothing hurtful about it, apart from when you come up, when you come up against the idea that there is a quintessential Asian American experience. But I, I think there are also enough voices out there that anyone who's listening will be aware this is not the case. So my answer would be, yes, we should do the, um, I'm uncomfortable with the word canon, but, but the um, <laughs> established plays, because they are, because they're good, because they're good theater, because they still have validity, because they're stories that are still worth hearing, but we should also broaden this, this base of plays and, and, and broaden the outreach to, to include other voices and, and other narratives and not confine ourselves. Um, and this is, you know, I in terms of identity, the, the number of hats we're allowed to wear and, and the question of as an Asian American playwright, do you have to write Asian American stories? Is everything you write necessarily an Asian American story? Or as, as you say, is Diana Sons play Asian American? Lauren E. writes about many different communities and, and some of her plays are you know, the hat maker's wife is the Jewish community and the golem story. So is that still an Asian American play? But Lauren, of course, should write exactly what Lauren wants to write. And I think we can be open enough to not try and put a box around everything. So I, I think just embrace everything is my answer. Just to continue on that idea, you know, if you look at uh, the, the idea of canon is interesting because if you look at David Henry Wong's plays and what Signature Theater chose to showcase for the season, they did um, Dance in the Railroad, um, Golden Child, and Kung Fu about Bruce Lee. All three, I saw all three of them, and they all have visually very Asian markers. Golden Child takes place in China, and you know, Dance in the Railroad. That's about the you know railroad wor workers in the 19th century, Bruce Lee, obviously, you know, the way he speaks is very Hong Kong, you know, accent. Um, so, it, and I remember that night when I saw Golden Child and I, at the s and I saw the matinee and then in the evening, the same theater, they were doing an August Wilson play. And the audience reaction was completely different. I think uh, the audience of Golden Child saw it as a very, oh, that's so Chinese, look at their beautiful costumes. Look at what they bound their feet, oh my God, that kind of reaction. And then August Wilson, there was a sense, oh my God, this is an American story. There's a, like this embracing, we all kind of share this horrible history, now we can move on. There, there is a, such a stronger feeling, and in terms of canon, I think you know, August Wilson can be considered African-American canon in theater. But even with David Wong's plays, it, it's ambiguous. It, we could claim it as canon, but it's also read as very foreign. And whether that is, Asian American to their eyes, I think we need to really question that. Yeah, yeah uh, my name is Francesca McKenzie and I'm a theater maker based in New Orleans. And I keep on thinking about what Jeremy said at the beginning of why do we have to classify ourselves as Asian American theater? Why isn't it just American? And uh, you speaking about the origins of that from World War II from a Japanese American experience. And I, Though I also agree there cannot be a quintessential Asian American experience, I would find it uh, uncomfortable to not claim my own artistic work as Asian American as long as our society is structured in a way where it's meant to elevate an America that doesn't include me. So it doesn't feel like I can say it's just American. You know what I mean? Like that would be the dream, but and I, I guess I open it up to everyone 
of whether they feel that way because I, I, I feel pride in being able to say I'm an Asian American theater maker and I don't think it would make sense for me to just say it's American because it's different. Well, uh, ju just um, to, to be clear, that the part of the Asian American label that I reject is the American part. Um, I, I'm <laughs> my <ant> identity <laughs> is very Asian, but my question is really, can I live and work in this country without being American? Can I just be Asian? Is that possible? Um, perhaps in time to come, I will start to feel American, um, but at the moment, Honestly, I don't, but I still feel that I have stories to share with people in this country, with Americans. Um, and I, c I kind of do confound a lot of white people who, who are like, <laughs> if I sounded foreign, well, I, I do sound foreign, but if I sounded <laughs> from Asia, that would be fine. And if I sounded American, that would be fine too. But speaking the way I do, people get really confused. And I kind of enjoy that. I don't plan to assimilate. actually are Asian, right? So there are students from Asia, and they are kind of get into my class, and they have a very different take on the material. And, and so I have students who are uh, American, but non-Asian American. I have Asian American students. I have Asian students, right? And, and, and then I have, uh, you know, myself. <laughs> and and uh, But I've been starting to teach more um, about that it's not just about the, the Asian American part, but it's about the drama part, right? So, so what I kind of stress is how there are certain things about dramatic structure and form that shape our understanding, our perception. We talk a lot about, you know, characters and their capacity to imagine and make worlds, right? I mean, because this is what drama happens. So, so in some ways, I mean, a play like T, right, which we're going to be doing this week, I was thinking about how to approach it in a way that isn't about a singular Asian American experience, right? So the sort of ideas that these women move between two spaces, right, um, imagined spaces of Japan and America, and that each space contains sort of a layering of different social identities that they have to negotiate, right? And, and these, if you know the play, you know that the actresses also play multiple roles, right? So at each moment you see them performing these kind of contradictory things, like in light of all these different um, roles and worlds that they have to negotiate. And so I think that's a way of getting uh, students who are not necessarily familiar with sort of post-World War II uh, American history, um, or, you know, who don't have a kind of direct Asian connection in their family line or, or out of their experience. That, that's a way to kind of hook, hook them in, right? Because I think the negotiation of um, the gap between our imagined world and what we would like the world to be, <laughs> number one, uh, and number two, you know, how much does our, is our ability to affect change limited, right, or make our worlds and I found that, for me, works, works really well as a teaching tool. And, and it also, I might add that I'm also teaching Shakespeare at the same time. So I teach the same thing in both classes, which saves me preparation. <laughs> so I don't have to think about more than one thing. But, but for me, it's sort of because I teach um, both, and it's cross-listed between English and um, Asian American studies. And so I get students from Asian American studies who really are, you know, they've taken Asian American history, they're really interested in the identity issues, the social activism issues. And then I get students from the English theater side who know a lot about theater and literature and form, right? But, but know nothing of the politics. So there's so always that bridge. But I actually really like it. And so one of the things I, I think is that it, it keeps it fun. And I used to feel really disheartened, you know, sometimes at the lack of progress. But I feel like maybe because I teach a lot of Samuel Beckett and it keeps going on. And, on. <laughs> and it's like being, being an educator, you know, I, I, I get them through four years and then they graduate and then a new batch comes in and some of these students come in and they have the same issues that students had, you know, 30 years ago when I started teaching. And, and if you don't kind of take it in that, well, it's my job to 
to work with them, or, and it's their job to learn. So, so if you don't have that, if I wanted them to know something when they came in, they, they shouldn't even be in my classroom, right? I mean, because that's why they're there, and that's why I get paid. Um, something I'd like to bring up uh, uh, is that part of what determines, quote unquote, the Asian American canon is what Asian American work can actually impact the mainstream ecology of theater in this country, mm -hmm. right? So in order to answer that, you've got to know, well, what is the function of Asian American theater in American theater? And here's the thing, artists love, uh, many artists love to say this, well, why can't I be just a writer and stuff, right? But honestly, it's naive, because what is the function of Asian American theater in the larger ecology? And actually, this is true of every writer of color. It is to educate, quote unquote, the mainstream about race. That is what they're looking for, and depending on what they're ready for, that's what gets produced in that time, okay? so. Going to Gina's thing, you have to be able to model what your ADs and literary people want. They may not be ready for the, these characters only happen to be Asian. Because what do we need to learn from you about people who are just human? No, we want to learn and have that cultural tourist experience, right? And I use that both in a positive or negative way. David Wong very consciously uses tropes that you could see as Orientalist because he knows that's what the market wants and he's able to also sneak in his own quasi-subversive thoughts about it at the same time, right? It is quite conscious and brilliant on, on his part. Um, so in terms of the we are in fact American stories, a success like Jeannie's play shows how that's still relevant now. Do you know what I mean? You, I, I, if everyone in Seattle knew about the story, then it might not be, do you know what I'm saying? But clearly it's not. They go, oh my goodness, he's one of our own. And then that's a window, that's an opportunity. You can use that as you will, right? And so that's also true of the super angry Frank Chin plays of the 70s. Mm -hmm. Off-Broadway was ready for it in that era. Probably they wouldn't do it now because it's not that fun to be slapped around and blamed, even if Frank is somewhat justified, right? That runs out. You'd much rather now see Chinglish, right? So then the global angle is right now, China is super relevant, right? Especially a China that is, you know, oppressive, patriotic, capitalistic, all of the above. So you're gonna get these what I call yellow dystopia plays, right? They're probably not gonna produce about, wow, China's finally rising up again after being slapped down by the West for the last 150 years, which is just an accurate view of China, it, it, which is just as accurate a view of Chinese history as Tiananmen or Hong Kong protests, right? So it's part of being savvy about, well, what is our function in that? And then within those parameters, if you're using their means of production, right, what can you sneak in or not? We're back to um, Francis's play that's being, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Francis, um, uh, her play that's being done right now in Chicago and then World later. of Extreme Happiness. Yes, the world, it's, it's, it's a hugely current global play, you know. Um, I remember when I read it and I was thinking, you know, it makes you think of your own, you know, your iPad and your iPhone and the laborers that, you know, work on these horrible conditions to, you know, I it's interesting because, you know, um, as an American, without any hyphen, you know, momentarily, I think we all use these devices. So I, th I think that play is a hugely um, relevant in a global sense play, you know, right now. Do you know, do you know that play? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah. Dan, I was interested in, in, in what you were saying earlier about the uh, curriculum um, that you, how do you define Asian American theater because it, it's it's come up several times during this conference. Like um, Kenneth Lin, you know, he's a Taiwanese American a playwright, but Ken is writing plays that aren't necessarily for Asian Americans. You know, he's written Asian American characters. Um, so would we call would we say that's an Asian American play? You know, if it doesn't have specifically Asian American characters in it, 
or if, like you said, a Caucasian playwright, right? I mean, what was that great production at Ma Yi about um, Magno Rubio, I thought, you know, which I loved, and that was not written by, you know, an Asian American. So it's, it's interesting, we talk about Asian American plays and Asian American productions, you know, it, it, it was something that interested me, how you define that. Um. Yeah, I've taught Magno Rubio as well. <laughs> um, but uh, just, just in relation to that, I, like, like I said, it's, it's a matter of teaching the work and then interrogating how it relates to what we think about as what is Asian American, what is Asian American identity. Another thing that I, I teach is I teach about um, Chinese opera in New York City, right? So looking at how, uh, and, and uh, like these performance traditions um, that are going on. So, so we look at um, uh, Meilan Fong's visit in 1930 to New York and how, you know, the, the, the constructions of race, there's, a, there's an article who's, the name I'm, I'm forgetting, but 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 look, takes a look at the construction of race around how Meilan Fong was received, as opposed to how the local Chinatown troops were received, and and looking at that, which is not something that my Asian American students even have thought about in relation to how do you construct race in terms of performance. So it's just looking looking at the ways that race and performance intersect around. Asian and a and American identities, um, and so uh, the more that we can keep it kind of undefined in a certain way, um, the more I like it. So, <laughs> so, um, so I, I like I said, I, I teach it, and, and the fact that it's in my course means that I am considering it Asian American theater. But if you go outside of that, you know, th a lot of people won't necessarily consider what I consider within the Asian American theater canon, if we want to call it that, or or not. Uh, can I mean, t just to respond to that, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. And when I used to teach in Asian American studies, we we're constantly having to grapple with this every quarter, right? Um, and but I, what I think is, it's a it's a performative, <laughs> just to use the the lingo of my field, right? The, the the designation of Asian American is a political choice, right? And it's it's a political act, just like calling Shakespeare stuff English is a political act. And I think. That's, that's what's interesting. If you claim it as a political agenda, <laughs> right? Like, it means something to say this is Asian American. I think part of what I think uh, is hard is trying to grapple with, well, there is this platonic correct definition that we're all trying to get to, and we just need to find, yes, what is the definition of Asian American? But you make it every time you, you claim it. And there are political consequences to deploying it. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. So I think if you can think of it as like a political claim that you make and deploy it or, or choose not to, um, but do it purposefully, I think you can either get the benefit of it or get the benefit of avoiding that label or whatever. But, but it's, a, it's a political act. It's not a pre-existing category that you're trying to correctly access, right? Uh, that's my def that's how I use it. Okay. Yeah, and just to continue on, on that, I think um, uh, I think what Gina's asking also is if you are a theater company and you make this selection, how do you market it? Um, and who is the audience for this? Um, I'm a actually curious about what you guys think. I, Tim, I don't know if you can speak to the East West players experience of how do you access the audience and how do you market a certain production as Asian American or not as Asian American? And I know that um, I, I think I talked to you for my book many, many years ago, and I think that's, that's when you were trying to move away from mostly Nisei subscription base to a much more diverse, and, and how that kind of worked out. And so can you talk a little bit more about audience and how the East West Players does? I think the idea about claiming is, is right on, because if we are doing a production of Sweeney Todd with an all Asian American cast, for that time being, Stephen Sondheim is an Asian American playwright in residence at East West Players. <laughs> and in fact, because we've done 12 Sondheim shows, we call Stephen Sondheim the most produced Asian American <laughs> composer at East West Players. So I think that that's right in terms of the way that, that we market it. Um, our audience is, is a very interesting mix. We're 54% we're Asian and 46% non-Asian. So. Uh, I think a lot of 
theaters would kill to have our kind of diversity uh, there. And we do think a lot about how we market our piece and who we're marketing to, uh, which is basically uh, a much broader audience than the Nisei audience of 20, 30 years ago. Um, that's changing. Our largest donors are Japanese Americans. Why are Japanese Americans the largest donors to, to an art organization like East West Players? How do we, how do we get all the other uh, communities to start giving Chinese American, uh, Indian American? Um, and all of this is, is built along a strategic plan that we're building right now. Uh, this is all going towards 2042 when we're gonna be majority minority. What's really important right now for East West players is to do more South Asian work and to do work that deal with biracial characters. Uh, at the TCG conference, a lot of questions were asked, are there any biracial characters that are half Asian, half Caucasian, or half Asian, half black that are written in the American theater? And the answer is there are, they are rare. And so East West players is now writing about the biracial experience. Who's our audience? I think our audience is, is slowly becoming more and more diverse. That I think it is good that it is becoming less Asian and more multicultural. Over at 2G in New York, when I took over uh, about two years ago, uh, I was asking the same sort of questions. So I commissioned a biracial a piece from Anna Munch, who's never actually worked in an Asian American theater. She's uh, half Chinese, half white. And so she is actually looking inward now to try to explore her own biracial story. And I paired up uh, Sung No to extend his work on Galois, which is about a French mathematician. And people are saying, why are you working on this piece and calling it an Asian American musical? But I feel like that curiosity that a Korean American playwright can, can uh, write about a French mathematician, and we call it an Asian American musical, really screws up with people, right? Is it possible? And for a few days this summer, it was possible. Right? And so those are the things that we're sort of tinkering with, sort of the, the, the borders of this place. Is it harder to market? Yes. Because part of what I'm discovering is sometimes people just want the thing that they think they know and understand. And so if you're coming in there trying to deconstruct it, I realize as chef or whatever I am, I have to shepherd people towards the next steps, right, uh, of, of what people are expecting and how can I get them there as opposed to maybe pushing uh, away what that content is. So, okay, P kind of in addition to this is really thinking in terms of one. We get one play. The only Asian American playwright we have produced at our theater is Diana Sans Fishes. So do we introduce our audience to the canon or do we introduce our audience to World of Extreme Happiness? Do you know what I mean? Like, so this is, this is my quandary now of like, they're asking me to submit Asian American plays to this selection. Like, so I don't want to disre and, but, I, but they're only looking at contemporary Asian American playwrights, really, because they're asking the global cosmopolitan questions. But I also totally want to honor and acknowledge the established Asian American playwrights as well. So I love the idea of challenging the idea of what Asian American is, but I feel like we're not even there yet. <laughs> so like, I'm in a place right now of like how, and I love the idea of like introducing an established kind of form or, or a story, but then sneaking <laughs> subversion kind of in there. Um, so this is my quandary, and I, I feel like I'm so happy that there are ethnic-specific theaters there that get to ask the bigger questions. But I feel like we're just starting out to construct before we can deconstruct. So. I'm, I'm just going to say to that that uh, the and it, it is very theater specific because it sounds like your theater is at Asian American Theater 101 level, and our, and other theaters are at Asian American 202. Uh, 202. And uh, I'm I'm in, no, no, serious. Yeah, I'm in seriously. And and though, you know, and those of us you know who are, who've been in the field for a long, long time, we're 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 in graduate studies because that we are 
you know, we're, we're pushing, we're pushing the, you know, we're pushing the envelope here. So, um, so basically, if you're talking about, you know, the, you know, e even though they are contemporary playwrights, you, know, you have to think this is Asian America 101. You need to, you know, have these people uh, navigate things that that are going to be unfamiliar to their audience. So, maybe, you know, maybe stuff with baby steps. Uh, that's all I can say. Yeah. We can talk about this after, uh, seriously. No, but it'll have to do with how many can they hire? What's the cast? It's very, very practical. It's very savvy. How many Asian actors are allowed? Does it have to be a mixed white Asian cast? Do you know what I'm saying? And we can, we can help, I think, with that. Um, oh, here's every Asian American play I've come across, you're all gonna think of exceptions for me, has fallen into one of three categories. So I'll tell you if it's useful to you. Number one, playwright of Asian descent. Number two, lead role character is Asian American. Number three, lead role is almost always played by an Asian American. Every play I've come across qualifies for one of those or more of those categories. And Butterfly, for instance, is only one in three, but not two. Stop Kiss, for instance, would be, right, et cetera, et cetera. So find me exceptions, I think that'd be interesting. But that's been useful for me. Any of those three are claimable, as far as I'm concerned. Let's call this a Jeff Liu test. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so to sort of um, respond to um, your uh, comments, um, so you're you're working with the theater in Philly or Philly area, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I just think it's so it sort of goes back to what Roger was saying. I think it is really important to um, and not necessarily just think as like oh well this theater in particular is at Asian American you know 1.0 and this one is at level two, but you really have to think about truly like your your contacts, your location, and you know, I think Philadelphia um, in the Delaware Valley region is in an entirely different place than Los Angeles or New York. You know, there's definitely similarities, but I think um, in some ways more differences. Um, so I feel like we are still at that level of sort of this um, kind of more traditional narrative of first generation, second generation. Um, and so that's sort of the standpoint where I'm coming from. And so, so I'm from Philly. Um, I'm an actor, but I actually um, not too long ago moved to New York and I went to school in New York. So I'm actually really excited to be here because um, I went to um, undergrad at NYU where I was fortunate enough to really absorb a plethora of resources within the Asian American theater field thanks to, you know, Asian, um, Asian American um, theater professors like Karen and Dan. Um, so I was really lucky, um, but I also acknowledge that, you know, well, I'm sort of also an anomaly because I came from Philly and grew up at a time and place, I guess, where I feel like, although Philly has a very sizable Asian American population, at the same time, um, you have to be kind of like in the right time at, at the right place to really find your Asian American people. And you, that may never happen. So if you're like me, then you grew up very confused. And it wasn't until I went to New York where there are all these resources in Asian American theater companies that I really began to understand for the first time, you know, Asian American theater 101. And at, sometimes I take it for granted because I just, when I tell people like my background, I was like, oh yeah, I went to school in New York and I learned a lot of things, took Asian American studies. But a lot of people aren't that fortunate to do that. And it was a very critical time in my life because if you think about it, you know, if I had come in at a point where, you know, maybe I went to see a play at 2G about a French mathematician, maybe I wouldn't quite get it, you know? But then if I went to like, you know, the public theater a few years ago and I saw Yellow Face, then oh wow, maybe I could, I'd really get it and I'd really learn something because I relate to this story. So I think, um, I guess sort of since I'm personally invested in Philly being from here, I think I like to really emphasize sort of contextualizing, you know, where we come from and how do we move forward from there and really thinking about the audience as in not just people who can afford to go to the theater and people who like to go to the theater, old white people, but people who actually grew up, uh, everyone from Philly, you know, so actually Asian American community from Philly and a lot of people like me who, when I grew up, I never actually had access to theater here. 
Um, it was just through like public school programs and scholarships that I fortunately was like always one of the, I was just the only Asian person taking like the acting class or, you know, um, going to drama society after school and stuff like that. So, yeah, and also I just want to say about Jeremy's play. <laughs> when I first read, because I was in the reading for Alameda, when I first read your play and we did the reading and the rehearsal, I think we were all trying to figure out, you know, where Jeremy was from and how he kind of came up with his story, because the play is called Alameda and it's set in, California, and when I was reading the play, it actually, I thought a lot about David Henry Huang, and I was like, I can relate to this so much. This playwright is like me. He's dealing with all the same issues as me. And then finally, when I met Jeremy, I was like, oh my God, he's not like me at all. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's from Singapore, he has this accent, and so, but in just hearing you talk more and more and really claiming this identity um, of yours that is not so much American, but still, your work is a part, we, we are embracing it as a part of this Asian American theater, you know, conference. I think, yes, that is a political choice and I think that's what makes me feel close to you as an Asian American artist. Um, just uh, to, to speak to that, um, my, my play Alameda, which um, had a stage reading yesterday as part of the conference and that Victoria gave a lovely performance in, um, was initially inspired by the 2011 Confest in Los Angeles. Um, and my experience of, of um, at the time I was still living in London and um, Tisa asked me to come to LA to talk about um, British Asian theater. And so I, I sort of not quite naively turned up in LA and went, we all have lots in common. Um, and, and a couple of days later, I was like, there is a whole codified Asian American identity that I don't have access to. And that was a really interesting experience and provocative and made me want to create a play about just, just what is this identity, which is not defined at all. It's fluid. It, it includes and excludes all kinds of people. Um, and yet, I definitely felt that there was some kind of invisible force field that I was on the outside of. Um, so, which is why I, I've been asking all these definitional questions um, and trying to assess what our role, each of us, how each of us finds our role in this ecology and then what this ecology has in relation with the mainstream and, and what that process of exchange is. I, I don't have any answers, but a lot of my writing is to do with asking questions. Uh, I'm not sure if you're supposed to go 45 or to six. Um, maybe one more question if or comment? Thank you. I have a very huge question building upon our discussion of differences and multiplicities. And it's about, can we talk about the state of Asian American theater as intersectional? Can we talk more about, for instance, gender and class and sexuality issues and the state of that it within Asian American theater? Yeah, that is huge. <laughs> do, do you, do you want to do have a specific yeah, point of departure for us, like uh, uh, an example you want to present to us? Yeah. I mean, all I can s say, first of all, is that whenever I teach Asian American theater, that's always part of my classes. And it actually, I would say that's all par part of all of my classes. Like like Joe, I, um, <laughs> you know, I, I teach a lot of the same things across a number of my classes, and so they all address the same si similar questions. So whether I'm teaching Introduction to Theater Studies or I'm teaching Asians in the US, I am constantly looking at um, issues of race, gender, class, and sexuality as they apply to the subjects and the plays and the objects of study. So part of it winds up being what, uh, what, are, you, what are the concrete objects you want to uh, study? And, and, th and there are things that I've, I've chosen to my in my classes for representational value. Right, as, as, um, so, so there, there's certain things like, I wanted to teach about internment, and so I would teach 12-1A, right? I wanted to teach about, um, you know, 
gay and lesbian identifications, so I, w I might teach a language of their own. You know, I, and, and, but within that, there's also other things that I want to address and want to make people question. So, um, so, so, so yeah, it, it, just, it just winds up being, there is a lot of stuff out there, and there's a, a lot of ways that you can approach it, and what, what is more important is to give the students the tools to sort of um, to find the way to get into these subjects. And so you can point them towards resources, you can point them towards objects of study, but in the end, they're gonna have to pick them up themselves and figure out what to do with them. Which, just quickly, um, I will say that something I've observed that um, cultural identity or ethnicity does seem to have become, in many ways, the dominant mode or dominant lens by which we um, approach a piece of theater. So we've been discussing World of Extreme Happiness as an example of Asian American theater, but actually the play is, for my money, much more about the growing inequality within China and capitalist exploitation. It's much more about the devaluation of women in China and, and the lack of agency they have. And yet it's hardly, I have not seen it discussed as a feminist play or a anti-capitalist play. It, it's an Asian play, that, that becomes the lens we put on it. Um, and it's very much either or, you don't see much discussion of intersectionality. What's it like to be a Chinese woman in particular within that play? Similarly, you, you see Che Yu being discussed as an Asian American playwright rather than a queer playwright a lot of the time, let alone what's it like to be a queer Asian playwright. Um, and I think that is something that in, in the morning plenary, um, there was a discussion about how criticism and reviews play a big part in the development of work. And I, I think that's something we haven't come across, but it... which seems critical because it speaks to the framing of the work and the way <laughs> in which... <laughs> I know. Oh, okay. I, I, I feel the universe is telling me to stop speaking. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say that um, the interpretation of work is as important as the work itself, I think, in terms of where we place it and how we see it, and that's something to consider too. other comments? I think that was very eloquent. I think that's a really nice place to end our conversation. Th th thank you so much for attending the panel and thank you so much for participating as panelists. <laughs>